two. Praise the Lord, Cathedral of Pentecost. Happy Resurrection Sunday. It is so good to see so many familiar faces, a lot of new faces, so thankful for that. Today we celebrate something amazing. We celebrate an empty grave. We celebrate wounds turned into scars. We celebrate victory that is still alive because we serve a Savior that is still alive. Today we celebrate that victory is mine. Victory is yours. Victory is in the house today. Victory over life, death, hell, and the grave. Victory over our sin. Victory over our yesterdays. Victory for our eternity. Victory for our tomorrow. Thank you, Jesus. Let's clap our hands and welcome the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords into this house today. Jesus, we thank you for victory. We thank you for your spirit in this house, Lord. Hallelujah. There's a lot of talk going on. I hear a lot of people running their mouths. Every word like an anchor just bringing them down, down, down. Yeah, we've all been looking for a silver lining. Something to hold on to and open hiding. I know a place we can go if you want to find it. Well, this is the good news. If you're breathing, it's for you. An empty grave, a life that's changed. It all points to Jesus' name. If you've been searching and nothing's been working, I've got good. Freedom is found. 
take a minute, breathe it in, watch a life turn upside down. This is the good news. If you're breathing, if you're breathing, it's for Thank you. 
done. He's still in love with you. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your love. Thank you, Jesus. We are unworthy and we were unlovable, but you saw something in us. Because of Jesus, we're here. Oh, oh, oh. You made a covenant with me. Signed by the blood that still speaks There on the cross at Calvary You gave it all Here on the cross at Calvary You gave it all to purchase You are the Savior and the God Who set me free Now
It's all because of the name of Jesus, because of the sacrifice that he gave for you and for me so that we would spend an eternity in glory with him with no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more hurt, no more brokenness. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm grateful for that. Is anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. We're going to move now into our time of healing if our prayer teams could please make their way to the front and if you're not familiar with what time of healing is the Bible talks about where two or three are gathered in in his name in the name of Jesus where we agree as one on any situation there he is in the midst of them and we don't we don't believe that as just like a you know, Jesus is here, you know, out, out in the atmosphere somewhere, but Jesus is here. He's present with you. He's present in your situation. We firmly believe, and we have seen it, where he has changed situations. If you're new here and you look around you, there's people from wall to wall filled with testimonies of how God has changed their life, and I'm one of those people. God has completely changed my life. So please, we encourage you, if there's anything that you're dealing with, anything that's breaking you, anything that's hurt, please come down this middle aisle here where our ushers will uh, guide you to a prayer team and we'll pray for your situation and God will move and God will change your circumstance and you've got to believe that in faith, that he's going to do it. Amen. Hallelujah. Please make your way down. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. The Savior knelt to wash our feet, and now at His feet we bow. The one who wore our sin and shame, now robed in majesty, the lady in some perfect love, now shines for all.
From the ashes of defeat, the resurrected King is resurrected.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Uh, pardon me. Well, you know what day it is today? Happy Resurrection, everyone. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to extend a warm greeting to each and every one that are here in the sanctuary and those that are viewing us online. Wish you a happy resurrection morning. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, choir. Thank you, musicians, for entering us into the presence of the Lord. And at this point, we want to transition to Brother Marty. is going to give us an update on the launch. He's over here. You may be seated. So at this time, Brother Marty, please come and give us an update on the launch, and we'll continue with the service following. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. It's good to be here this morning. It's like a packed house. Got to squinch together. Uh, I'm here to uh, bring the update on the launch program. And many of you may not know what the launch program is. But the launch program is a, a program we started and uh, to build a new building. And it specifically earmarked, the money that comes in on the launch is, is specifically earmarked for a new building that we might be able to grow bigger and fit more people in here and affect and help more people. Now, the launch, it's a three-year program. And the, I think Sister Susan did the last report on it. I think it might have been in January or something like that. But since January, let me just bring you up to date. The launch program, the pledge, the initial pledge was $1,450,000. Okay, so thus far, uh, with that, we've already taken in, the church has taken in 591207 And six cents. I don't know about the six cents, but can you round it off to a dime? So anyhow, but that's what we've taken in so far. And thus far, since the last, since the last report, there's been 151 donations, and that has brought in 25,966 cents. So, so far, I think we're, uh, I don't know, according to, what our projections are and everything, but it, it looks like we're right on target and, or ahead of target, if anything else. And uh, it's just, you know, if you don't know about it and you want to get involved in it, uh, talk to Brother Justin or one of the, or, or Sister Pam, somebody like that in the office. And if you want to get involved, you're welcome to get involved. I mean, we're not going to turn anybody away with money. You know. I mean, you say here, and we're, we're there, you know. So anyhow, uh, but i just like to testify. This is off script. Nobody told me to do this. Brother, I don't think no one's going to do this. But I, don't, I, I just feel like I, I heard a, a report uh, a few months back that, and please, if this squinches your spirit, I'm sorry. But uh, Jesus talked about giving a lot talked about the poor, taking care of the widows. They, they, they made preparations for everything, for everybody giving money. And, and I heard a report that only 20%, and this was in a big church, and I don't know what kind of church, I couldn't tell you what kind of churches it were, but there are churches that are viable churches that are having church every day and have thousands of people. And they said 20% of that people pay tithes. Only 20%, and I couldn't imagine that. And then I was thinking, you know, a lot of people haven't heard about ties. They don't know about I didn't know about it when I, I was brought up Catholic. I didn't know about ties. They just send us, when we were little kids, they sent us home with a box of envelopes, said, here, fill this out every, every week, you know. That's how they did it in the Catholic Church. 
I'll give you a box of envelopes for your family. But if you want to, and this has been my experience, if you want to open up your experience to God and experience more, it becomes a spiritual thing. It's just not a giving, a manual pocket, you know, thing you go through or, or that. It becomes a spiritual thing. And God will open up doors for you like you've never seen. If you have a business, if you have a business, people will be calling you up and saying, hey, can you, can you help me out here? Sure. You know, I'm telling you, it will open up more doors and you will walk closer and have a better understanding, not just understanding, but you will have a better relationship with God because it's part of God's word. It's part of God's word. Now, if we're not here to do a Bible lesson on that. We could. But I'm just telling you, 20%, and I thought, boy, that, that's, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know. But that's what, that's what they did a study on it. So if, if any of you haven't started your relationship with ties, try it. Try it. The Lord said, try me now. Try me now. See if I won't pour you out a blessing. Try it. Try it. That's all I'm asking. Try it. It'll work. I guarantee it'll work in my life. You know, I'm getting old now. Like David said, I was young. Well, I used to be young. But now I'm old. And he said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. And I haven't. I haven't. God has provided, and he will provide for you. All right, Brother McFarland. Thank you. And, uh, Remember your launch. We're still flying. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Marty. And at this time, I want to welcome the ushers. I keep on dropping my paper. I want to welcome the ushers. We're going to pray for the offering. And follow, following the offering, Sunday school is dismissed, and we'll have a time of meet and greet. So please stand as we pray over the offering. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for the precious day that we have come and gathered here to celebrate. Oh, what a day it is. Well, you took the sting out of death. And you took the victory from the grave. And you got up and you gave salvation to all. And Lord, we thank you for that great privilege of getting to know you and to have a relationship with you. We pray that you'll bless this morning's offering. Let it be for the benefit of your kingdom. We also pray for the preach word, Lord. Anoint your servant, the man of God. We thank you for the people that have gathered here this morning to see a standing crowd. Lord, we are so blessed. I pray that you'll bless our week that's ahead of us. Oh, Lord God, help us to walk in areas of blessings. And Lord, help us to be a blessing to others as well. We thank you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Sunday school, you're dismissed. You could come on down and give your offering, and we'll have a time of meet and greet, and we'll convene in three minutes.
Praise the Lord. Please make your way back to your seats as we reconvene with our service. I have a few announcements for you this morning. Following the announcement, we'll have a special video prepared for you. And then we'll have a Bible reading by Catherine Briggs. Sister Catherine Briggs. Okay. Oh, praise the Lord. Great, good, good, good. Our first announcement this morning is Tuesday evening will be our home teams. If you're not familiar with home teams, on the first Tuesday of every month, we break out our service into homes across Broad County. It is a time of word and fellowship in a small group setting. You can find a home team's hosts and locations by clicking on the home team's app or on the app or the website or visit the service desk to get further information about that. Secondly, this Friday is all night prayer service starting at 8 p.m. all the way to 8 a.m. Saturday morning. You can plan to come in a two hour time slot throughout the night. And thirdly, are you a chick? Are the chicks in the house? All right. All the, that means the ladies. I'm sorry. Okay, the ladies. Do you love to chat? Woo! Okay, all right. If so, join us. It says us. I'm not going to be a part of it. But join the ladies as we endeavor into this new ministry of Chick Chat, a safe place where, you, where young women can reflect and talk about the tough stuff. And there's a lot of tough stuff in our society. A place where young women can feel encouraged, equipped, and confident to, to go out into the world and to be who God has called them to be. This will be for all middle schools, high school, and early college ages. Although we will occasionally have a split out group or split sessions, bring a friend and join our kickoff party on Saturday, April the 6th at 10 a.m. at the church where we'll be discussing, determining our calling, led by Sister Sophia Urshan, okay? There will be food, games, and chats. You don't want to miss it. If you have any questions, please see Sweetie. There she is over there. And um, the last announcement I have, if you're a man in the house, this Friday, we're going up to Akala. For the men's conference, if you need further information about that, please see Brother Armando. Okay? God bless you. And we'll now we'll have the video queued up for you. And please direct your attention to the monitor here.
word, church. I invite you to stand with me as I read from Matthew 27, verses 33 through 54. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put up over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking with the scribes and elders said, He saves others. Himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there, when they heard that, said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split, and the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. This is the word of God. Amen. You may be seated. Worship with us as we sing this anthem unto the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus.
Before there was everything, before there was anything, there was nothing. And before there was nothing, there was him. 
When the light pierced through the darkness, there was him. When the heavens were stretched out, there was him. He painted the skies. He rippled the seas. He sculpted the ground. And the word was with him, and the word was him. That's my king. I wonder, do you know him? The word says, a king humbled himself, clothed himself in flesh to be born in a manger, grew up to be, of all things, a, a friend to, to the broken and the shamed and the disgraced, the overlooked, the sinners. He loved them still. Though there was a plan being formed against him, but unbeknownst to them, this was the plan. A king was to be executed for a crime he didn't commit. A king was to be buried in a tomb, unfit but necessary. A king was to be resurrected for the hope of those who betrayed him. That's my king. I wonder, do you know him? Our finite brains can't even wrap our heads around his infinite glory, but still he takes the time to walk across the cosmos to meet us at our level. A trio of nails couldn't hold back his love from reaching us. He is Adonai. He is Elohim. He is El Shaddai. He is the I Am. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the first and he is the last. Do you know him? Do you know his name? Do you know his name? He is who was who is and who is to come and he is coming quickly his name his name his name is Jesus that's my king that's my king that is my king I wonder I wonder do you know him That's my rock, that's 
Hallelujah. I, I must, I must tell you something right now. Because y'all are about to get out of control. You better pull it together. Behave. We celebrate every Sunday. I mean, you, you, you see Pentecost on the sign, you know it's going to be a Holy Ghost party. It's just going to be. Even when we're discouraged, we're still partying. We, 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 we've got joy. Somebody said, I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Another one said, now this is archaic, so y'all are lost when I say it, but somebody said, joy is the flag that is flown from the castle of my heart because the king is in residence there. We got joy songs. The world takes our joy songs and remakes them and tries to get the God part out because they feel so good. But I want to tell you, on Resurrection Sunday, there is honestly, I must admit, an extra juice. <laughs> there is, I, I feel joy juice every week at church. I feel the juice of the Holy Ghost. If you can use that word and say that. I feel the nectar of the Holy Ghost. I feel the wine of the Holy Ghost. But on this day, on this day, there is a brand new pep that shows up in my step every resurrection day because this is the day that he decided to let the world know. He, listen, this was a little illustration. What we're trying to warn you is what's coming is the big one. This is tiny. I mean, this is tiny, tiny Tim. There's nothing to this illustration in comparison to the day when God rolls up his sleeves. Steps out of heaven's portals. But right now, ladies and gentlemen, we're worshiping him on faith. I'm worshiping him not because I got everything I wanted because I know everything above nothing I got from him. I said he reached down and every good and every perfect gift come down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness, neither any shadow of turning. Glory. I'm going to speak to you for the next few moments on the emancipation of mercy. I want you to turn to your neighbor's and let them know, I need to know about mercy's emancipation. I need to know about mercy's emancipation. Hallelujah. My heart is overwhelmed with joy to see every one of you today. Behind every face there is a story. And as my mind and eyes soar over this congregation I know that's not what my svelte figure makes you think of that I'm just soaring it might be more like a blimp but we're going to work through it but as I as I blimp over this congregation there's a story behind every face and those stories are like songs to my heart and I'm so blessed and honored that you've chosen this Sunday morning in 2024 to be in this house and worship the king of this house. In the annals of history, a document blazed forth, not merely ink upon parchment, but it was really a beacon of hope amidst the darkness of civil war. 
but it wasn't just the darkness of civil war in America. It was really a darkness that had emanated since the beginning of time. The idea that one human being could put another human being in bondage, could use them as a slave, could access their life's blood and strength to do their own personal bidding, not the goodness of that individual. And the Emancipation Proclamation was written. It was written by a very brave, daring man that I admired deeply. President Abraham Lincoln, with people on every side, both of his political leaning and the other political leaning, against people, maybe even family, against the political capital that came by his wife's family, Mary Todd. Abraham Lincoln walked alone with steady step and strong gaze and declared that the soul of humanity is to be unshackled from oppression. The chains of slavery were to be tossed forever asunder and never be sanctioned again by a government that we could put any influence into. It was declared and it was recorded, but it was not completely reported that this Emancipation Proclamation had been given. Juneteenth is a celebration officially. It has become more than that, as many things in America's life has become more than what they were meant to be. So I go back to the official celebration of these things. In the 19th of June, 1865, the news finally reached the out places of the country. It was two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation had become law, after it had been declared and after it had been reported. Whatever it was that stopped it, either wicked hands or newspapers that would not tell the truth or governments that refused to buy in to this Emancipation Proclamation. I cannot tell exactly what hindered the journey, but after that, on the 19th of June, the news finally reached an outpost in Texas where finally the last that we knew of of that time, at least as we have officially seen it, the last slaves were freed who had been declared to be free two and a half years before that. Liberty had been delayed, but liberty delayed does not mean liberty denied. And in the fullness of time, God had something to say. He said it and made it so that all could understand it. He expressed himself. It was not in Hebrew or Greek or Latin, but he spoke by actions. And we celebrate this event. It is sometimes overspoken and most times underreported. But what Jesus Christ did on that day some 2,000 years ago was something that was far more than just getting on a cross and dying so that others might live. Oh, it was that. But liberty was delayed. But I, pro I proclaim to you today, liberty delayed is not liberty denied. There are some here this morning that started in this house thinking you were going to celebrate the freedom that came about by Jesus Christ. And yet, hanging over your heart are condemnations and walls and barriers and clutches of bondage that try to declare to you, it's a great story, but it's not for you today. God did have something to say. He would make it so that everyone could understand it. And he did it in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, that city that is in the Middle East that is alive today, that is a bustling, teeming source of economic in this energy and religious fervor. It is a place that many countries and many nations and many eras have fought over the place of Jerusalem. 
But the place of Jerusalem in the day of Jesus was a place of status, no different than where you and I are today. We live in a world of status. We live in a world of prestige and station where people put you according to your job. If you are an entrepreneur, you are the, 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 everybody you uh, have as clients are your boss, okay? Uh, I know they say, I want to be my own boss, but that tells me you haven't been in business. Uh, <clears throat> because if, if you think owning the business means you're, you're your own boss, then uh, your business hasn't succeeded. <laughs> That's all I got to say. You learn that everybody has to answer to somebody. There are clients, there are accounts, there are relationships that you know you're going to jump for because they have demonstrated believing in you. So you're going to transactionally believe in them. In Jerusalem in that day, status was definitely clear. We know a certain side of the status from the biblical report. But there's more to the record of Jerusalem than just what is in this Bible. And you know one of my favorite things to do is to try to go back and learn the setting in which all of these events happened. One of the things that Rome did was they often would go into a country or a nation where they were making a great influence and promoting their Roman peace and they would reconstruct the city. One of the things they would often do in every city was put a main thoroughfare down the middle of the city. Back then, eminent domain wasn't necessary. They just showed up and pushed back. And they would show up in these towns and completely renovate a wide road that would go from north to south in these cities. They were called the Cardo Maximus. It was just essentially a road. And then to come in and show that Rome had its footprint in this place. They would erect amazing giant columns to go the whole length of this Cardo Maximus. There is today the remains of this Cardo Maximus road in Jerusalem. It was put there when Rome came down to impact the city. We don't read a lot about that in the Bible because it was not necessarily the tone and tenor of what God was trying to do in the world in that day. Because when he came to Jerusalem, he was coming to impact his people. He had said, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And Israel wasn't all that impressed with Rome. There was a great press back against anything that was Rome in their country. In fact, the currency of the temple had to be changed to some uh, nationality that, was, uh, that would not put images and, and idols and gods on their coinage. And so they would have to pay a temple tax. But before a temple tax was paid to demonstrate that they were not under the subjective, hard, heavy hand of Rome, they would exchange their coins in the outer court to get away from the money that was heathen into a money that at least would have the pictures of fruit on them or not some picture of a man. And that was how they paid their temple tax. But in Jerusalem, the Herodians did exist. The Herodians were people that were very involved in politics. They were very involved with, uh, with Rome. They really liked the styles of Rome and the ways of Rome. They had Roman baths that were there in Jerusalem in the days of Jesus. Amazing structures that were put out like temples of spa and training and physical uh, uh, growth and, and teaching one another to wrestle and go about these processes. In these Herodian spas, they had different rooms. There was a room called the anointing room where they would go in and anoint their body with oil. Then there was a yellow room where they celebrated the sun and a green room where they celebrated and they would make it out of marble. And there were three different chambers where they would sit in with steam and heat. And then they would go to the area of working out and exercise. This was in Jerusalem when Jesus was walking in Jerusalem. It's not much reported in here because the Herodians don't have very much of a voice in this book. Why? The Lord was reaching to his people. It was always the intention of God, as Genesis 12 says, that the whole earth will be blessed 
through Abraham and his seed. God always intended that the Africans would be blessed from the Israelites, that the Europeans would be blessed by the Israelites, that the, uh, that the people in Americas would be blessed by the Israelites. The whole world, everything that walked this terra firma we call earth should be blessed by the hands and the songs and the poetry and the psalms and the different ways of Israel the seers and the prophets would see things that the whole world was supposed to be blessed. But there was a problem. The status of the world had grown into a church setting. It was the church of the living God, the people of Israel, had bought into this status structure. The ugliness of culture in every culture is dealt with in courtrooms. The darker facets of society are taken to a room that's, that is filled with bailiffs and back halls and handcuffs and high seats and robes of jurisprudence. The complexities and the contradictions that mar the human condition are always taken to a back court area where they are laid bare by the staring eyes of jurisprudence. Well, there was a problem. This man named Jesus had come and he did not buy into the status structures that Israel had built. He didn't buy into the high walls of acceptance and the tall places of law where you can only get to God if you come through this way. And Rome had gone and decided, we'll build in your city theaters. But the, the children of Israel would not allow a permanent theater. So Rome had built an amazing wooden theater through in the side, large theater in Jerusalem. We don't ever read of Jesus going to that theater, do we? But if you go to Jerusalem now and look at the rebuilt old city, just across the brook and through the valley and up on the, uh, the other side of the city was where the theater was near the tomb of David, where the upper room was. That's where the theater was built. Why don't we know about this? Because in our Bible, the Lord wasn't concerned with getting to the status of the world. He was trying to break through the status that had been built up among his people. He had to tear it down so that he could get to the people. I want to come to you because it doesn't matter how low or how high, how known or how unknown, how enfranchised or how disenfranchised one may be. God has a plan for you. If you were born with bundles, God has a plan for you. If you were born with nothing, God has a plan for you. If you were born in the church and dedicated in the highest holy place, God has a plan for you. If you were born in the grotto and at the bottom of a back alley of a prostitute's house, you have a plan made by God for you. There's no place you can go, no place you can come from, no place you can be. God doesn't have a plan for you. Mm. Well, preacher, I used to know him. God has a plan for you. Preacher, I just got off a 21-day fast. God has a plan for you. Preacher, I've cursed God to his face. God has a plan for you. You don't know how deep and dark my sins are. God has a plan for you. I don't care where you came from. You are no matrix to my God. He knows everything you need. It's interesting how they had to get rid of this Jesus. He was messing up the temple structure. He was eating on the Sabbath and healing people on the day it's supposed to be a day of rest. How dare he walk in here and say, I can forgive sins. None but God can forgive sins. And so they take him to the back room filled with bailiffs and put bonds on him and spit in his face and mocked him and tried him out there to try to find that they could get rid of him. Status seems to still be in charge. And so they finally determined that he's guilty. 
And so they take him out of the courtroom. And if you know a little bit about the structure of Jerusalem, if you don't, I encourage you to go to YouTube and watch a little video. I'm sure it's out there on the layout of the day of Jerusalem in Jesus' day. They took him out of the Antonio Fortress, which was just on the north side of Temple Mount. But along that way, there was that awesome place that they made called the Cardo Maximus. Well, if we're really wanting to take care of Jesus and show the world that he is finally destroyed, we're going to walk him down the Cardo Maximus. No, that's not where they took him. If you go and track what is known nowadays, and Christianity has made what we call the Stations of the Cross. It's called the Via Dolorosa of that period. It means the way of suffering. They didn't take Jesus down the Cardo Maximus, but their way he went was a meandering trail through the old town, really just small side streets, through the underdeveloped and overforgotten poor areas with just the usual people. We're not going to walk him down the road where Prada lives and where Gucci lives. I mean, Gucci lives. We're not going to take him by the marketplace and the glorious restaurants that are porches underneath the, the palms that adorn the colonnade of the Cardo Maximus. No, we're going to take him east to west, not north to south. We're going to take him sideways because anybody that's messing up our structure, we're sideways with them. And so they started through this crooked east east-west course through the old city. And then they did not take him to the highest place in the area. No, that would have been over on the top of the Mount of Olives, over higher where you look above the Mount of Olives, where an amazing hotel is built even this day. No, if we're really wanting the city to see him, we would have put him up there. But they took him to a little old rugged stony place called Golgotha. It is not the most prominent place nearby. It might be the most neglected part of town. And they hang him there. Now, you came to Easter. And I'm sure you have thought that Calvary has always been the most prominent mountain in Jerusalem. And if you've been to Jerusalem, I'm sure you might have always thought that the Via Dolorosa is the most celebrated way to walk. But I want to inform you the truth. No, no. Jesus was somebody they were trying to dispatch of. Get him out and take him through the back roads. I know in our world, the cross was the biggest thing that day. But if you would have been on the Cardo Maximus on that day, you would have been enjoying your hot tea. They didn't have coffee back then. It had not been discovered. No, the guardians of the temple had become so exclusionary. They had marginalized Israel. If you weren't of such status, they didn't have much time for you. If you weren't of certain birth order, of certain birth place, or certain birth tribe, you might not be so great. And of course, the Gentiles, who had much time for them? No, whatever hatred they had for Rome had metastasized into the house of, that was built for mercy. See, if you know the construction of the temple, you know there's layers to getting to it. And I won't talk about the layers, but on the inside of the inside of the inside, past the outer court, into the inner court, past the brazen altar and the laver of water and past the golden uh, candlesticks and the altar of showbread and the altar of incense, past this amazing veil. When you were the insider of all insiders, when you had the place of all prominence, once a year you got to lay your eyes upon a place called mercy. Mercy seat was inside that. Now, for all of you been around the church, you already know where I'm headed. But let me tell you something. Mercy had been shut in there. Why? Well, it was God's assignment. God wanted mercy to be there, but he didn't want the purveyors of the message to get so bunked up. If that's a word. That's a big word. That's a Greek word. That's, that's me breaking out the Greek on you. In the Greek, it's bunked up. 
He didn't want the preachers to get so exclusionary and high and mighty to where they're strutting their prestige and their place. And so this is these those that are somewhere outside because life had dealt them a bad blow. Disease had marred their ability to walk normal. Their mind had been clouded by oppressions and exorcism was needed because demonic darkness had covered them until that moment. These people had been the only people that had had access to the God of the universe. He had been only accessible in one sacred place through one special people. And in the Holy of Holies enjoyed and imagined a monopoly on the divine. No more would this be the case because when Jesus died, he made a gesture that was not in a language that needed to be interpreted. But the sun hid her face. The earth shook and the stones began to break. And then all of a sudden, straining eyes on tiptoe feet were looking into the holy place. Because certainly this day in preparation for Passover would be a special day. But when they peeked into the holy place, something struck them. Because the torn veil hung down there like two ragged strands forever broken and whatever was beyond in the holy of holies was now accessible to everyone two sensational events happened on one day in the city of Jerusalem one happened in the city the other happened in the suburbs in the suburbs a man hung and died but in the city the people looked to see this veil still standing and the, the veil was no longer together the Bible says from top to bottom the veil had been torn what was God saying God was saying whatever structures of status that men think they can put up to keep me away from you, I am removing it now. It doesn't matter what your name is, who you were born to, how much money you have or do not have. I am still your God. It could be that I am preaching to a billionaire today and you've had a hard time getting through life because nobody treats you like the soul that you were born to be. All they see is your stuff and they're always trying to get to you. I want to proclaim to you, our God has a plan for you today. He sees you as a soul that is loved, that is cared for, that is watched for, that is wanted, that is served. Serving him is where the joy is all about. And if I happen to preach, I probably don't. But if I happen to preach to somebody broke today, probably not. It's probably somewhere else. But if for some reason someone here is pretending like you've got it all and you really don't have nothing, don't think for a moment that God doesn't have a plan for you. You're no less remembered than the billionaire is remembered. You're no more forgotten than the diseased or the well are forgotten. Ah, faith in that era was racial. Faith was racial. If you were not of Israel, you were not in the beloved. You were loved, but not in the beloved. But God saw this plan of using a race to get the blessing out was dead. And he decided he would no longer be fixed in, fenced in. That anybody who would hunger and thirst after righteousness, anybody no matter what your nationality or if you were what they describe as illegal, anybody could be saved. That it wouldn't just be local, but it would be global. That it wouldn't just be them, it would also be us. It wouldn't just be there, it would also be here. What do the opening chapters of the Bible mean? You've heard about the Garden of Eden. God walked with man in the cool of the day. I'm about finished. You, I want you to understand something. In just a few minutes, we're going to have our prayer teams come up here. You've already witnessed it once. We had time of healing. That's a time when we bring certain needs and special requests and our petitions to the Lord that more or less have to do with the temporal. It's more a temporal kind of prayer. And of course, a lot of people come for temporal kind of praying because most of us just 
have temporal revel revelations. <laughs> We don't think much about the eternal. See, the second altar call is for eternal considerations. So the first, it's well populated. We'll have a line show up. People get in line and just go all through. Every time of healing can go sometimes up to 30 minutes a time of healing. But it's so curious to me. When I have the eternal prayer meeting, people really don't need it all that much. Sometimes the line doesn't get very long. And it's a very difficult thing to get it to go for 30 minutes. We still have the singer singing. We still have the band playing. But nobody needs eternal help. We just need a blessing tomorrow. We just need our job to give us a bonus today. We just need the promotion that's coming next week. And so we have a temporal time of healing. That's valuable and it's biblical. But we also in just a moment are about to have an eternal time of healing. And it doesn't matter what hell has told you that you don't have coming to you. I've come to proclaim to you, you're not too far. You've heard it said, musicians come many times today. That's my king. That's my king. It comes from an old preacher. His name was Shadrach, Meshach, Lockridge. Literally. They asked him, said, Dr. Lockridge, what is the first two letters of your name? He pastored in San Diego, California, where I was born. He was there when I was there. He said, well, my name is Dr. S.A., I mean, S.M. Lockridge. And they said, well, we got to know what your names are. He said, well... <clears throat> My name is Shadrach Meshach Lockridge. And they said, well, where did the A go? He said, well, the A wasn't put down because some folks may not properly understand what I'm saying. He said, if my name was Shadrach Meshach and Abednego, he said, too many people would think I was saying Shadrach Meshach and a bad Negro. He said, so they left the A out of my name. <laughs> Dr. Lockridge said, when I was in Bible school, he said, the place where I slept, there wasn't much to it. It was real humble and quiet and tiny. But he said, it burnt down to the ground in Bible college. He said, so for a little while, my name was Shadrach Noshak <laughs> Lockridge. But he got so anointed, and if you want to, you can go listen to it later. But he's the man who, under the anointing of the power of God, got us understanding about the king, who the king was. He said his king was the king of Israel, the king of righteousness, the king of ages, the king of glory, the king of heavens, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords. David said, the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth showeth his handiwork. There are no means of measure, he said, that can define his limited love. No barriers that can hinder him from pouring out his blessing. He is enduringly strong, entirely sincere, eternally steadfast, imperially powerful, impartially merciful, as said in the words of Isaac, that's my king. He is the center savior, the centerpiece of civilization. Yet he stands alone in himself. He is august, unique, unparalleled, unprecedented, supreme, preeminent. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He is the highest personality in philosophy. He is the miracle of the age. He's the superlative of everything good that you choose to call him. He's the only one able to supply all of our needs simultaneously. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and he guides. He heals the sick. 
He cleanses the leper. He forgives the sinner. He discharges every debtor. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He is my king. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent. He beautifies the meek. The meek. Do you know my king? He is the doorway of all deliverance. He is the pathway of all peace. He is the roadway of all righteousness. He is the highway of all holiness. That's my king. His love is enough. His grace is sufficient. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Do you know him? That's my king. I wish I could describe him to you today. He's indestructible, incomprehensible. He is irresistible. That's my king. When I walked through the door today, he was my king. Mercy. Mercy refused to be shut up. Mercy wanted to be emancipated. Mercy had been closed down to too many people for too long. And the Lord himself right now is in this place to tell you, you have mercy waiting on you. He has always been and he will always be. He has no predecessor. He has no successor. You can't impeach him. And he's not going to resign. Romans 4.24 said, If we believe in God, Jesus rose from the dead. And then it goes on, Who was delivered for our offenses? Who was raised for our justification? I need to tell you what that means. He was delivered from the grave because we are offensive. I know none of y'all are. But if you come here very long, I'm sure I've offended you. He was delivered. <laughs> I'm a nice guy. I really am. I only sinned twice in my life. Just then was one. <laughs> Listen, when we forget him, it's offensive to him. When he gives us breath to breathe. You know, I've met some people who think, boy, they got more of God than everybody else. Well, last I checked, you only get to breathe the same amount of air they do. Last I get to check, they get to enjoy their steaks just as much as you do. Well, you don't know the abomination they have. Let me tell you something about abomination. That's why he went to Calvary. Calvary's no tiny event. Calvary's no small event. Calvary is a giant event. You can't do anything in one day that can remove you from the power of the cross. I said you can't do anything in one day. For all you theologians out there that are talking about sin against the Holy Ghost, let me tell you what that is. That's not words you say with your mouth. That's actions you do with your soul and your body and your mind. And you can't do it all in one day. You got to do it day after day after day after day after day. Because God, he keeps showing up. You keep cussing at him and he keeps showing up. You keep turning your back on him and he keeps showing up. He loves you more than you know you don't you weren't there preacher you weren't there you don't know how bad it was you don't know how dark it got you don't know how many witches that I've I've comported with you don't know how many wizards I've prayed with you don't know what kind of curses I've put out of my mouth well I don't I'll agree I don't but you also don't know the power of the cross because everything you've ever done, when he got on that cross, when they spread him wide and said, if you save others, now save yourself. And he would not come down from that cross to save himself. He died 
so you could be saved. Huh? He was delivered for our offenses, but he was raised for our justification. Some people still know the bad on me, but he doesn't. <laughs> uh, some people know something on me. He doesn't. I'm not talking about living in dark sin. I'm just talking about all of us have days we wish we didn't have and thoughts we wish we never thought and actions we wish we never acted. But the God of heaven said, my blood is enough for you now. Singers come, prayer teams come and line up. Please, we're about to have some folks that are gonna be delivered from their offenses. We're about to have some folks that are gonna be justified today. He rose for your justification. It doesn't take 10 years. You may have been walking from him for 10 years. He can fix it in a moment. I said he is not far from every one of you. <laughs> Paul was talking to a heathen people when he said that. He said, he is not far from every one of you. These people you're seeing come up here right now, these aren't perfect people. These aren't giants of the faith. These aren't people that have been vetted by Tim Dips in Jordan and finally clothed into the Holy of Holies and covered with oil from the olive trees. No, these are people that have known that from where God brought them to where they are today, is the same journey that he's got for every one of you. So they're not gonna join with you in praying like they've got something on you. They're gonna just join with you and say, I know where you're at, Tato. I know what you're feeling. I know what you're carrying. I know what you're under. And God is sent to set you free. Romans 4.25, who was delivered for our fences, shall we stand, raised for our justification, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have access by faith. Everybody say faith. faith. We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We rejoice. You're not gonna leave this place depressed today. Some of you can leave having been filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives you the utterance. Today, you can get the Holy Ghost. You say, I thought I gotta learn how to do a bunch of stuff. No, no, no. Today, you can be delivered and justified and set free today. So we rejoice in the hope of glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. <laughs> oh, you guys. The Holy Ghost is given unto us. There's some already coming. You feel the pull? He wants to justify you today. He wants to pull you out today. He wants to tear down every wall that religion has put between you and God, that maybe even a preacher has put between you and God, maybe that some family tradition has put between you and God, some wall that you might have built block by block between you and God. He wants to tear it down today and say, as I tore the veil, I'm coming to you because the love of God is shed apart abroad in the hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. He died for you. He rose for you. He's living for you. As they begin to sing, I'm opening this altar. Why don't you take a chance? Walk into an eternal prayer. Come and watch how eternity 
will change your today. Eternity will change your, God bless you. God bless you. That's it. Don't be bashful. This is who we are. This is who we are. Come on down. I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you. That's right. You There's more coming. Come on down. Come on so down. You came and we want to tear down the walls. You thought I was worth keeping. We want to tear down the walls. So you cleaned me up inside. You thought I was to die for. That's it. That's it. I see it right so here. you sacrifice your life I see a so hunger. I could be free, uh, so I yes. could be whole, yes. so I could tell right there, it's a everyone I That's know. That's a miracle right now. I was worth saving. Oh. So you yeah. came so you the walls are coming down. My life. The walls you are coming I down. Was worth the walls are coming down. So you clean me up right inside. Down.
me a big sign. You thought I was one. So you sacrificed. So Oh 
Resurrection Sunday. We're glad for every one of you. And you're always welcome because the party never stops at the Cathedral of Pentecost. Have the happiest Resurrection Day of all. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Show the love of Jesus Christ one to another. Have a great week in Jesus' name. Help me say, he set my feet on the rock to stay. He put a song in my soul to a song of praise. A song of praise. Hallelujah. He brought me 